Can we close the gap with improvements in production? Let's take a look at that in more detail. How can we do that? How can we increase production? Well, if you look at what we've done in the past, remember that slide of how much of our land was actually used for agriculture. We've expanded the land by even 500 million hectares since 1960. That's about 100 times the size of the Netherlands. But expansion of agricultural land is the primary cause of ecosystem degradation. Conversion of forests, savannas, and peatlands into agriculture all contributes to global greenhouse gas emissions. So there are limited opportunities for further expansion of productive land. There just isn't that much more land to expand into, and doing so actually has a huge cost on our ecosystems. The other alternative is to be more efficient. So to increase the amount of production on the existing land and water. Let's take a look at this, because this is a question of not just production, but yield. How much production per unit area, which is tons per hectare in this case. Every plant has what's called a potential yield. This is the maximum amount of grain or fruit or vegetable that a plant can produce under perfect conditions. It's due to the genetics of the plant and the temperature, and the ideal solar radiation, and the ideal amount of water. We can very rarely or almost never achieve potential yield for a number of reasons. In a farm, there's something called the attainable yield. And this is the yield that can be attained if a farmer is able to manage very well his water, his or her water, his or her nutrients, and the overall management of the farm and the crop. That's the attainable yield. But we'll see, because of various constraints, Many farmers never reach that attainable yield. So what we have left is the actual yield, which you can see is much smaller than the attainable and smaller again than the potential. So this is what we typically achieve on a farm. And the reason why it's much less is because there are factors like pests and weeds and diseases which actually reduce the yield. There are two main approaches to increase actual yield. The first is to close the gap between actual and attainable with improvements in management. We've been doing this year after year as we've been using more and more technology and getting more knowledge about how to manage our agricultural systems. The light orange bar here gives an idea of the sort of gains we could make here. The reasons for this gap, however, vary with space and time. So there's a role for spatial and temporal information to understand where those gaps are and what we can do to close those gaps. Another way to increase yield is to increase the potential yield by breeding better varieties with more genetic potential to produce more. If we increase potential yield, we increase attainable yield and actual yield benefits as well. So where are these yield gaps? This global map showing areas of the world where agriculture is produced or where crops are produced tells you where the attainable yield achieved is reaching its maximum, like 100%. In dark green, these areas are already at the limit of what we think can be attained. And the areas in red and yellow are where there's still a big gap, where there's a big gap between the actual and the attainable yield. So you can see there's a lot of variation. But also there's a lot to be gained if we can close that yield gap. But we need to know what the constraints are. They need to be understood. They need to be mapped. And the solutions need to be spatially targeted. So you do the right thing in the right place at the right time to improve the yield and basically close the gap. This is an interesting question because this means investing. This means investing in the land. This means buying better seeds, using new technology. And if you think about land ownership, how many people own the land that they farm? If you don't own the land, why would you invest in it? If you own the land, maybe you have more incentive to invest in it. So there's a really interesting link here between the incentives to close the yield gap and whether you own the land or not. Zooming into some details here, showing some high resolution remote sensing imagery you can see the spatial variation in yield here for an example for maize fields, ranging from high yield in red to lower yield in blue. So there's a lot of spatial variation here, and understanding that is a big part of being able to close the yield gap. So we said increasing the amount of land, it's not really an option. 
but increasing the production on existing land could be an option to close this production gap. But we'd need to increase yields by 32% more than we did in the last 40 years. So we'd need to do even better in future than we have done in the past. We know that 90% of our fisheries are over exploited and already fully exploited. And resource limitations and climate change we know will depress yields in many regions. Unfortunately, about 30% of our crop yield is lost to pests and diseases in the field. So whilst some increased productivity is possible through improved management and technology, it's highly unlikely that we can close the food gap via increased production on its own. Now we can look at the other side of the equation. Can we close the gap with changes in our consumption? So this is a question to you. What do you think? Let's look at this in more detail. Let's start with how our food is used now. About 30% of our food is wasted between the farm and the fork, whether it's in the processing, the transportation, or our wastage at home, this all adds up to about 30%. That's a huge amount of these resources that we're just not using efficiently. We've also taken the decision that some of our crops are converted into biofuel, not to feed us, but to feed our cars or our trucks or our aeroplanes. Edible crops are also converted into animal-based foods. It's not food for us, it's for livestock and other animals. Now, some of those conversions are quite efficient. We can, we can put a lot of um, effort into aquaculture, and that results in a lot of protein back. So that's quite an efficient conversion of food into animal product. But other conversions are not so efficient. The consumption of beef, for example, is the least efficient. And we know beef consumption and the demand for beef is increasing by 80% come 2050. We're also in the situation where we now have more people who overconsume than those who consume too little. In general, as a person becomes wealthier and as nations develop, food consumption increases. We can afford to buy more. Food waste also increases because we can afford to waste food or we think we can afford to waste food. And we tend to consume different things. We consume more resource intensive food like beef, dairy, etc. So given these trends in consumption, and if they keep going this way, it's highly unlikely that we can close the gap by just looking at changes in consumption alone. So where are the challenges here in closing this gap? The production challenges are, of course, largely in the rural areas. The biggest gaps between actual and attainable production are still in developing countries, and that's where we have the most to gain. The consumption challenges are largely related to demands from urban areas. And because of rapid urbanization and growth, the demand from cities in developing countries is approaching the demand we already see in developed countries. So we need solutions to these challenges. And these solutions need to increase food production on the existing land and water. There's very little scope to plant crops on additional land. We need to reduce the environmental impact of our food production. So we need to make our food production systems more sustainable so that our ecosystems are more resilient and can provide the kind of services that we need to produce food sustainably. And we need to promote a better balance of foods that we consume. This means changing consumer behavior and changing attitudes to food. And all of these things must have benefits for social and economic development in both urban and rural settings benefits for the producers, benefits for the consumers, and benefits for everybody involved in those food systems. So this isn't just one solution. This has to be a menu of solutions that need to be implemented coherently and appropriately in the right place.